So, so here we are at a panel that's awkwardly named Celebritarian, the Celebritarian panel. <clears throat> Peter and David Gay and Julie Borowski and Robert Murphy. And my name is Jeffrey Tucker. And they're Celebritarians. Who can't fill a room. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. None of us like this, this term celebritarian. It's a little bit silly. And I'm sure nobody has set out to become that. Um, you know, for my part, I just thought it was a good, good word to call my passion. And then at some point, I, I, I realized suddenly one day that I was a public figure, uh, which was an awkward thing. I'm sure you know, all of you have gone through this stage, which I would actually be interested to know how you made that transition from just being, you know, a nerd to, 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 to becoming a public figure. In my own case, it, it was a, a, a strange way I had to rethink my, myself, really. Um, and then, I'm sure you've gone through this too, but maybe we can talk about this. You know, I see myself being talked about every day online. Um, and most of the time, I'm completely detached from it. I'm like, huh. They're talking about some guy named Jeffrey Tucker. I'd like to meet him someday, you know? I, really, you do get a, it's almost like an out-of-body experience sometimes you have. And, um, and, and maybe something else we can address is how do you deal with abuse, uh, which is, is very interesting. As, as creators, content creators, we're always anxious for, for praise, of course. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's the criticisms that that devastate you the most, you know, that penetrate the most. I once knew this um, a very famous soprano, and and I got to know her. And she was Cecilia Bartoli. Does anybody know? Her? She's like one of the world's famous, most famous sopranos. And she said that that after a concert, she'll she'll have, you know, like 500 fans walk past her saying, "You were amazing tonight." You were marvelous tonight. You moved me to tears. I've never heard you so wonderful. I've never heard Mozart sound that good. And then one person will say something like, it wasn't your best night, was it? <laughs> and that's all she'll remember. <laughs> you know? It's true. You know, so criticism can affect you in a funny way. So. Um, in fact, why don't we just open there? Because I, I think this is, in, is an interesting topic. For my part, what I sometimes do is that I'll write people personally, which Facebook allows you to do. You know, I'll say, you know, I'll see somebody say something just horrible. And I'll write them and say, listen, I just wanted to apologize to you because I think I must have offended you at some point in my life. And I just want to apologize for that. And if there's any specifics you would like me to fill in, uh, just let me know. But I'd like us to get over whatever's between us. And most of the time, they'll write back and say, I'm so sorry. I'm actually a big fan. And I really admire, you know, and thanks for writing. And I'm an asshole, you know. You know and I'm like, ha that worked. <laughs> Sometimes that doesn't work. They're like, finally, you've written me, you jerk. You know, then they're, they're all in. So, but most of the time it works. But I think, for my part, I try to maintain a, an atmosphere of civility in the face of what I think is an increasingly brutal social, uh, social culture out there. I think so. I think, I think they're all getting like, increasingly nasty. I don't know if it's just me, but like, this last year I've had to block people for the first time. My block this. If you want a screenshot of my block list and you want to copy it, you're welcome to it. You know, um, but it's getting longer and longer. Sorry to say. Um, well, let me just open it up to the panels, and wh why don't each of you like address that point about how it affects you to see yourself treated as if you're non, you know, you're not yourself, and you're dealing with critics out there. Go ahead. I'll I'll take it in a slightly different way because I I think people hate you more than they hate me. So uh, I don't know why that is. Um, but, but so it, the one thing Jeff talked about that is that I have found it, it's just awkward is you don't know at some level, like you don't want to be a jerk, but you don't want to presume. So I'll just give you an example. I was at Porkfest one time 
and you know people were I gave a talk or something and people were coming up and saying hey hey I love your stuff can can I get a picture with you and of course oh yeah sure 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 and so then so one guy was talking to me for a while and there was someone standing kind of near it looked like he was just kind of looking off in the clouds and killing time and so I was trying to be real nice and I was still, I'm talking to the guy that hit, you know he had my ear about you know, how would we privatize roads in Bangladesh or something, you know, some really important pressing social issue. And I, and I said, hang on a second. And I said, hey, and I caught the kid's eye and I said, D did you want to take a picture? He goes, no, I'm waiting for my friend, right? And he, he was looking at me, he didn't even know who I was, right? And so, and then another one, this just happened, just to keep the humility there, I gave, so some of you saw, I gave a talk today at 10 in this very room, right? And it was, okay, fair enough, it was a decent talk. And then, then Jeff Dice gave, the, the lunch address and I was in the, the speaker's room or whatever you call that thing over there with the, where I was getting coffee by myself. Some, I won't name his name, I don't want to embarrass him. He comes in after lunch, he catches my eye, he goes, what a phenomenal talk. And I'm thinking, well, it wasn't that great. It's par for the course, my friend. And so I'm getting ready to thank him and he goes, man, Jeff just really laid it out, didn't he? And I was, mm, yes, he did. Yes, he did. That was a great talk that Jeff just gave. Wow. That coffee, watch out, it's hot. So. Anyway, there's, there's, just, there's lots of things like that where, again, you're trying not, and, and you make the wrong assumption, and it's funny. But uh, so I, I think I will just pass on the mic at this point. Sure. So you asked how I deal with haters online. Um, I get a lot of haters, but I think it's a good thing because when I first started out on YouTube 2011, I didn't get any haters. I had a few watchers, mostly Ron Paul supporters who supported me. When I started getting haters, that meant that people outside the libertarian community, the libertarian bubble, were watching my videos. So that was a good thing. Um, I think at first it affected me as it affects pretty much everyone because I wasn't really used to people saying mean things to my face like that, um, insulting my looks, all that kind of stuff. So I think over time, I kind of just grew thicker skin. You hear the same things over and over. You know, what's it, why can't you talk right? You know, why do you have a big nose? All these kind of like things that you may like be kind of sensitive about at first. You're like, okay, I've heard this. Okay, get some original material. But like as you said, um, when you confront people, oftentimes they sing a different tune. I like to read comments about myself because I like to be self-aware. And some people will share my videos and I'll see a comment below, a Julie Browski is so annoying, I hate her, blah, blah, blah. And I'll just respond and even if I'm just like, thank you or something stupid like that. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, uh, I'm so sorry. I, I actually really like your videos, I'm, I'm sorry. So like it was, it's different because they don't really see you as a real person, I guess. They just see you as somebody behind the computer and then you're actually talking to them and like, oh my gosh, this is a real person. Um, also, some people have talked trash about me online and then I see them at conferences and they're really, really nice to me. Right. So it's just like, okay, they're gonna talk trash online because that's what people do online. Everyone who puts themselves out there is going to get hate. If I didn't want hate, then I should just stop right now. Um, so you have to realize that comes with the territory and sometimes it's personal, but eventually you just kind of get used to it. And sometimes I like to mess around with people. I like to mess around with people trying to tr troll me and I troll them back and it's fun for me. So yeah, I guess Julie, that's you, how. You say you have to get, you get used to it, you grow thicker skin. Do you worry that that's changed you in ways that's not good? No, 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 absolutely not. I think it's changed me in a good way. Because I think before I started on YouTube, when somebody would say something kind of mean to me in person, I think I would take it more personally. But now, I think I'm a more confident person because I'm used to people criticizing me in a way that I wasn't before. Because I don't think most people are used to criticism. I think, especially my generation, the millennials, we're used to being the special snowflakes. We're used to being called, you know, oh, you're so special, everything like that. I wasn't used to that amount of criticism. Uh -huh. So now I'm like, okay, I'm a confident person. I've heard all the trash about me, and I'm still standing. So. I see. That's interesting. Um, one other question for you, Julie. Um, oh, do, do you ever, I, I sometimes get people writing me saying, you've got the wrong friends. Like, you shouldn't be friends with so-and-so. Do does that happen to you, and how do you respond to it? Yeah, I, I guess. I've, I've, I've had those other libertarian um, people, they think I'm 
really good friends with another libertarian commentator where you know I may have met them briefly and I may share their stuff but they think we're really like this tight knit like celebritarian like, community yeah. and I'm like you know I like that person they're, I like their work but we're not that close but I think they kind of have this in their mind that we're really good friends I mean I'm somebody who really tries to get along with other people especially if we're in the same libertarian community but people will attack me and I respond to that but otherwise, I try to keep it cool. Okay, good. The brother's meme? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You know, I don't, we don't really worry about getting insulted uh, too much. I did, I was, I got started out, I was involved in the Ron Paul campaign really heavily, 2008, 2012, really, really heavily. And I would take insults against Ron Paul personally. <laughs> Anybody pick on me, I don't really care, but it was like, I was really protective of the libertarianism and of the campaign and stuff. It was pretty absurd. And uh, then switching over to the memes page, we just, I mean, we put stuff out there. Our goal is to make them feel kind of bad about being statist idiots. And we, well, it's, it's a luxury that we have, I mean, in a way, because, you know, our, our idea is to kind of make people question their idolatry. Um, so if they come back at it, it's just more evidence of their idolatry and we'll confront it that way. But, um, but in terms of being personally insulted, I mean, we grew up in New York where if you, you say screw you to somebody and they say screw you back, it means we're going to be best friends for a while. So it's not really too bad. And plus, we grew up uh, in public city schools with the last name Gay. I mean, <laughs> you can imagine. So we're, we're just not bothered by stuff like that. So. But, uh, but we do. We, we troll people back. They, they, they say something silly. We'll just write, oh, that's a very, uh, very coherent argument. And uh, you've, you've persuaded me. And just from there, every, everybody else on the page will just take over and, and they'll just go after them. We, we won't do it. Well, it's, uh, it exposes human nature, which is, uh, you know, not that civil necessarily. But we, uh, we sort of walk a line between civility and savagery. So <laughs> that's part of our role as memesters. You can't really be, you know, polite and academic all the time. You have to be funny. And so you have to make people a little, you know, uncomfortable. And that doesn't bother me. I don't want to be, you know, we, we've taken down a few comments at times, not many. Not your comments. Have you commented? No, this is another thing. We're celebritarians, right? Well, you ask how we made that transition, and I believe the answer is like three weeks ago. Because our page has just really, you know, exploded in terms of popularity very recently. How many likes does it have? It has 60,000. I just did a meme of a fat guy on the internet about two or three weeks ago that said, when your page hits 50,000 likes. And like we've gone, you know, the other, the next 10,000, that's because Julie shared something of ours. That always, you know, <laughs> that always helps. Yeah, thanks, Julie. So um, anyways, but yeah, when, when somebody is very, you know, insulting and mean or whatever, it, we have a little bit of a difference from the rest of you. Most people don't see our face, like virtually ever. Very recently we did because there was an IP thing. And I was like, you know what, here you go. My face is my property. Don't dare touch it. So of course, everybody memed it which was the intention. I mean, I'm not, you know. Anyway, so, uh, yeah. We, we're just gonna fight back. If somebody is, if somebody is getting a, a little uncivilized, then we basically have to throw that back in their face. And the fact is that we do have a lot of people behind us. So as soon as I drop out of a uh, debate, I've got people who are gonna debate on my behalf, so that's pretty, uh, pretty nice. Yeah, he just sparked something that when I see people attack, like if I post something and see people arguing or some, what it'll be more is like somebody posting something on Facebook linking to something I had written saying like, what a stupid comment, you know, and then I'm just, I usually scroll it just to see, is there at least one person coming in to state, you know, defending the position I would have made? And then usually if just one person does it, I move on because it looks, you know, you got to be aloof if you're a libertarian. Sometimes it's annoying if somebody argues on your behalf, though. I have a lot of white knights on Facebook. Um, white knights, if you don't know, if you're a girl, there's guys who will argue on your behalf because they want to impress you. 
but sometimes they argue really poorly on my behalf, and they'll say, no, this is what she really means. I'm like, no, I didn't even, I didn't even mean that. So I don't, I don't like that. And then, do, so is it true, do you go out with them after, or is that? What Julie means is. <laughs> Stop trying to do that, buddy. You know, I get, I get that a lot. If I comment something like from, because pages can cross comment on each other, and if I comment on a post of hers from Liberty Memes, and the guys, everybody knows that the people who run Liberty Memes are a couple of guys. So I comment something like, how dare you comment on Julie's page, stop trying to get into my girl's pants. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? It gets pretty silly, this is a lot of fun. Internet pants. <laughs> Internet pants, yeah. Techno pants. Okay, here's, here's uh, a question I'd like you all to think about. There was a time in my life I thought the goal was, was the goal we had was to convert everybody to libertarianism. <laughs> and I've recently begun to think that that's not right. That our goal should be to obtain more liberty in the world, actually. And it could happen even if people don't buy the whole loaf. You know, they don't go into the whole thing. Um, so I wonder what your own strategic outlook is. Are you just trying to make people think to question a little bit at the margin? Or are you tr really trying to, you know, to bake full-blown libertarians you know, who are, you know, read For Our New Liberty and commit their life to Rothbardianism or what, or what have you? Go ahead. Um, I, I am. If the, if the issue is, are you trying to, you kind of switch there what the pivot point was. If the issue is, are you trying to achieve more liberty or get more people to be libertarian in their mind, even though that sounds like the wrong thing, I go for the, the mind, that my view, there's all kinds of different strategies you could do, and I think all of them to succeed would require more people to believe, yes, this is the more desirable end state. And so that, to me, I try to convince people and just paint a picture of, this is how a market works. So since I'm an economist, I focus on those issues, obviously, because I think for a lot of people, the reason they support interventions is because they erroneously believe certain bad things would happen that fall under the umbrella of economics. So to me, I try to teach economics, but I don't harbor any illusions that I'm you know, cranking out particular you know, people who think like me in all respects. I would say both. I think more libertarians equals a more liberty in our society. But when I first started out on YouTube uh, 2011, I was doing political stuff before, but my YouTube channel, where most people know me, really started out as a way to promote Ron Paul. Um, I did Ron Paul videos, Ron Paul 2012, Ron Paul, blah, blah, blah. And eventually I, I started, you know, the campaign was over, and I kind of wanted to continue to make videos. So I made a couple um, anti-Obama ads. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in my speech, but what I noticed was that it was reaching conservative people outside the libertarian community. And they were watching my videos and they liked me. And I thought, wow, I have this opportunity to reach these conservative people. And so I've kind of, that's kind of been my thing recently to bring in conservative people to the libertarian message, you know, do, use different messaging, you know, use humor. And, you know, I come from a conservative background, so I understand where they're coming from. So I tend to take that approach, getting more conservative people to accept libertarian ideas. How do you know in doing that you're not just promoting conservatism? Well, because you have to continue to talk about libertarian ideas. Like, I'll talk about this tonight. You, I throw out a lot of red meat for conservative people to get them on my page. Um, you know, guns, religious freedom, all that kind of stuff. But then I sneak in libertarian ideas. So all of a sudden, they're being exposed to libertarian ideas from somebody that they like. Yeah, well, basically our goal, I mean, I don't know if we care or not whether people are converted to libertarianism through what we do, but in general have this uh, just knock from their heads this idea that the state is, is almighty and can just solve all their problems magically. 
Um, you know, so, so we'll make a joke about something, whatever political issue that the state is just stupid on, and people will just start to disregard the state. They'll just make a mockery of it. They say, you know, the, oh, they are silly, aren't they? And, uh, well, maybe I just shouldn't be as invested in politics as I am. You know, on a personal level, I've always examined myself that way. Every time I take something too seriously in politics, I'm like, wait a second, this is just not as important as living my life and well, raising listen, a family. I, I know exactly what you mean. So. I mean, I, I've ignored politics for a better part of 15 years, unlike the rest of you guys. I mean, you were like all in with the Ron Paul movement. I was like too busy putting up interwar texts on monetary, you know, economics. I just I tried not to. But this year, I started paying attention to it very closely. I tell you, it's, it can get you down. Um, and, I, and I had somebody wrote me the other day and said, you know, I always admired you as being the joyful libertarian, you know, with the happy and all that. But you're not that way anymore. And I was thinking, wow, maybe I'm not. And I, I think I've just been watching too many uh, political debates. Actually. You know, actually, I, I have a response to that. When I, was, uh, when I was really active for Ron Paul, one of the things I would say was, you know, you should stay active when we're done with this. You know, everybody should stay active. And a lot of people just kind of fell away and got burned out. And I understand that, you know, it's a lot of them are Bernie Sanders supporters now, burned out. <laughs> but uh, I would always say, don't get burned out, you know, stay involved because this is really important. This is going to be a generational struggle and all this hyperbolic stuff. And then I realized I was kind of getting burned out, too, by being mm. so politically active. But what a, I like about running a, a memes page where we're just kind of making jokes about this stuff now is instead of getting burned out and disappearing, we just kind of evolved into something else. And just along the journey, just figured out another way to reach people and another way to spread the message. So yeah. you wanna Our page isn't as cool as it used to be. But anyway. Um, yeah, I think that my goal sort of changes with every meme that I make. These are, you know, I mean, a meme is something that amuses me, so I put it on my page. Really, how Liberty Memes started, not the joke way that I said earlier, but um, how Liberty Memes started was just memes that I made, again, for my own amusement. I kind of shared them around, and it kind of just grew as a file. Somebody said, you should make a proper page out of it, so I did, you know. And um, these, the in order to make the message get out there, which I'm all for doing, um, is it, the content has to be shareable. It can't just be something that somebody says, I like this. They have to want other people to see it on their page. And so it has to be, has to be relatable. It has to be clean, and it has to be funny. And I find that a lot of libertarian content is relatable in a, a country where politics has become such a joke Politics is a joke that writes itself, so I have material to go on all the time. Taxation is theft. How many people are getting robbed? Everybody. So when you, when you say, okay, you got Futurama Fry saying, not sure if the guy with the weapon you know, demanding my money is a common criminal or works for the IRS. Everybody gets that. You don't have to be a libertarian to say, oh yeah, I am getting robbed by the IRS. So that's, there's kind of you know awakening the libertarian in a number of uh, status well, you, minds. You know, you touched on something with with the opportunities that our times provide us. I mean, let's face it, we have gone through, and you guys know more than I would about this, but a little bit of a recession in the liberty movement. You know, since since the 2012 bubble, probably, and a lot of attrition, and people have gotten bored and they've fallen away and that sort of thing. And I think that's just, I mean, it's something I I saw. Even before the campaign began, I thought, oh, God, I'm dreading the end because it's going to get ugly. And it has. And yet, we might face a real opportunity. I wonder if you agree. I mean, this has been a boom for the memes industry, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> These candidates clean... give me new material every day. I mean, and I, it's a perverse thought, but part of me wants Trump to win, if nothing else. You know, it, well, wait, because. Uh, because he's so easily attackable from a libertarian point of view. And, and it clarifies our position. And we really can, at least to my mind, in a way split our, our, our hatreds between the, <laughs> between the left and the right at this point without feeling any kind of uh, squeamishness. I'm not sure that would be entirely true if, for example, Cruz won. You know? So anyway, just throw that out there as a possibility. This is a unique opportunity for, for us as liberty-minded uh, I th thinkers and workers. If, if I may, I think um, you dreading the end of the Ron Paul campaign or the liberty movement in general that I happened. I dreaded the beginning, you know, by the well, way, um, because I well, knew what the end would be. 
Well, but, you know, in yeah. a way, and you say this is a unique opportunity that we have right now because of our times. You know, times do change, and we have this right now, and this is relatively new. But I also, you know, kind of dread the results of an election like this where status A or status B on either side is, I mean, really lean heavily towards censorship of ideas and of, of any kind of free speech. I mean, there's the don't hurt anybody's feelings campaigns that are out there on both sides. And so when these people, Hillary or Trump, I mean, you, who's going to censor you first when they get in the White House? And, and you know, we really we want to criticize these people as much as possible right now and seize the opportunity uh -huh. to just make them all feel like garbage and <laughs> prove that all these people are really trash, you know, as much as we can right now because you know uh, we, we might not get another chance. Well, we we might be either locked anywhere. up or just yeah. shut down, and they'll just yeah. disappear the the memes page or whatever. I mean, yeah, community standards. Oh, you, you made somebody feel bad, or you, you put a Nazi mustache on Hillary. That's, you, can't, you can only do that to Trump. That's not fair. And so they, they, stuff like that. And then they'll just shut, they'll just shut you down. That, so they, they try to engineer. Topic, like what, what, what kind of real threats do we expect from the coming government? But anyway, just to go back to this point about re unique opportunities, Bob. Sh sure. So just to respond, um, on this last point, I mean, I noticed in my career that I write for various outlets, and they all are in different levels of, you know, how extreme are they in terms of pushing free market ideas. So in some places, you know, I'll write about cutting marginal tax rates. Other places, it'll be like, what would happen if they privatized, you know, the judiciary, that kind of stuff. You know, there's a big spectrum there. Not everybody wants to go that far. So, but I definitely noticed that when Obama was the president, and then that it was very convenient. It gave me cover so that when the Federal Reserve was doing all the bailouts and the QE and whatever, I could speak pretty freely and conservative outlets would run that stuff, whereas if Bush had been the president, the, it, it couldn't have been, I mean, I would have been allowed to say, I think QE2 is a mistake, because da, 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 but I wouldn't have been able to do like sweeping generalizations about, mm. there shouldn't be a group of central planners in Washington controlling interest rates. That's like controlling, you know, they wouldn't let them set the price of oil, whereas they were fine if I talked like that when it was Obama, because, oh, Obama is, is a Marxist. And so I was trying to take the opportunity, I think that what you're saying, like, to when they really understood the target to push it and to solidify the critique in a way that was a little bit more pure, I guess, or foundational. So if Trump wins, I think a lot of progressives might see, you know, maybe we don't want the government able to stop my aunt's kidney transplant yeah, when there's a President exactly, Trump. Because, you know, right. I, I, I was happy when it was Obama because he's a good guy. I would never use politics when it comes to health care. But these are Republicans, you know, this Trump. So I, I think it's the, that, that sort of element. Yeah, I, I, I too will welcome a return of, of left-wing anti-authoritarianism. He touched on something really important, actually, using these opportunities to, you know, say, well, You've got the you've got the new president in that I can pick on the things that you used to hold sacred because he's doing it. But unfortunately, that hasn't been the case with the anti-war movement. You know, with with Obama, it's just like war doesn't exist on people on his side. And but the Republicans at the same time have continued the war machine and they've continued to to cheerlead for it. And you can't say to them, you know, you've got this golden opportunity, you know, in Obama to say, okay, the. The war issue is squarely in the Democrats' court now, and we can just abandon it. They won't do that, so that's 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 unfortunate. You can't, you still can't attack people for being or, or convince people that being pro-war is wrong because it's still sacred to their party from back when their party was in charge. It's, yeah. it's silly. Yeah. Well, Julie, um, I don't know if that's exactly true though, because look at what happened during the whole Syria thing. I worked at FreedomWorks at the time, and we were sitting down and. You know, we have a lot of conservative audience. And we were like, okay, how can we message that we're against the Syrian war without conservatives freaking out? We framed it as anti-Obama. We called it Obama's war. I mean, what conservative is going to support Obama's war? So that was kind of a good thing about foreign policy. But on Trump, I'm not sure if libertarians are unified against Trump. Uh, we kind of talked about this earlier. There are well, libertarians some libertarians surely are. It's, um, <laughs> I are they? You're trying to say they're not libertarians yeah, if they was, support that was, Trump. That was a snarky comment. But yeah. there are people who have been and still consider themselves libertarians who support Trump, and a lot of them are on my Facebook page. As soon as I say anything against Trump, they they will attack me. So I think there are libertarians who support Trump. And I think one of the reasons is because the left hates him so much. 
that they, it's kind of a spiteful thing where these kind of these, what we call social justice warriors are saying, you know, Trump is evil, Trump's racist and stuff like that. I think that kind of gets libertari some libertarians, some maybe right, right wing libertarians like, well, let's support Trump because I like to piss off the left. Enemy of my enemy. Yes, and I see a lot of that. So I don't know if that we're exactly unified. I think the movement is kind of fractured at this point. Well, there's a pendulum swing against political correctness, and that's what he represents. But just because he's pissing people off doesn't make him a good person. I mean, Charlie Manson pissed off a lot of people, too. <laughs> hey, you guys piss off a lot of people. Yeah, and I'm not a good person. <laughs> Uh, Julie, um, if I can ask something. So I, I'm really curious about this, because you, you've really been at the heart of a lot of activism over the last, what, five years, really. Um, and you probably joined Freedom Works at a time of great exuberance over the Tea Party movement and the possibility of bringing together libertarian concerns with, the, with this Tea Party movement that got increasingly confusing over time. It's like, and, and you've, you were there about the time that there's, I don't know what happened. Was, was there a, a separation that took place? Did, the, did Freedom Works just get you know, taken over by a kind of Tea Party concern? I mean, did your dreams get shattered? I mean, what, what the hell happened? No, actually Freedom Works got libertarian more over time. I started there in early 2010 when it was very conservative, but we only focused on economic issues, so issues that I agreed with. But we wouldn't touch other issues like NSA spying, foreign policy. Eventually, uh, when Matt Kibbe took over everything, we actually became more libertarian. So that was great. And to be able to message that to a more conservative audience, we had a lot of success. As far as the Tea Party movement, that kind of got lost. I think they, their biggest issue became immigration. Um, you saw in that recent happening. years, when? yeah. What year? I don't, I don't know exactly when. I know. I'm so sorry. Um, so when I heard Trump talk about immigration, I thought, "What are you talking about? Nobody's going to care about." Oh crap. gosh, yes. But we always knew, got calls. He? Why aren't you anti-immigration? Why aren't you doing this? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, there's always that nativist sort of feeling out there, but I mean. To me, the Tea Party, okay, as you know, it was started with the Ron Paul movement originally. And then it, you know, whenever something becomes popular, more people get on board and try to shift it into their own direction. And so it became a conservative thing and a Republican thing. And then everybody's Tea Party, Ted Cruz's Tea Party, <laughs> whatever. That even and Rand Paul had a book on the Tea Party that was a very good book. So, but the Tea Party became, uh, their entire mission in life was to make Barack Obama a one-term president. So they failed. And I mean, that's that's all that they were. They they became extinct after that. Yeah, it's you know, I, I was proudly would proudly call myself you know one of the founders in the Tea Party movement. Just being involved in it, I was even at the Tea Party planning meetings for the 2007 fundraiser for Ron Paul in Boston. I mean, this is going way back, and uh, so I was proud of that until 2009 tax day. They uh, see all these conservatives and neoconservatives being like, oh yeah, this is the Tea Party, this is the one. And that, that was unfortunate. They did a lot of focusing on Obama's doubling the national debt and Obama's spending all this money. And it's all really, you know, debt that was piling up from previous administrations. And I mean, I'm not saying that Obama's not to blame now <laughs> for what he does. Anyway, um, it, but they took a lot of the focus off of sound Austrian economics and just said, okay, that's just national just debt. And they just, just go about it being yeah. this national debt campaign and, and, and Obama and spending. The problem isn't the debt, it's the spending. And Obama's spending. It was about the omni, uh, what's the stimulus bill and stuff. Yeah. And so that's what they made it about at that time. And it was like, no, no, no. You know, trying to fight them and show them Austrian economics, I just kind of gave up because <laughs> they weren't hearing it. But I also noticed, and I don't know if you noticed, but there were a lot of Democrats where I live, because uh, New York State was really pro-Hillary Clinton during uh, the 2008 primary. And a lot of those Democrats were, were disaffected with the fact that Obama, to them, stole the nomination from their, from their girl. And uh, so there were a lot of Democrats who joined Tea Party where I live because they, well, because they were racist. <laughs> And now they've continued their racism, and they've just gone full Trump. It's just it's something. Wow. That's weird. Okay, any other thoughts along those lines? 
Well, it's just that there's not that much of a difference between Hillary and Trump. It's not that hard I to jump the, from uh, one right. to the other. It's just, you know, the reds and the browns sort of blend together. Uh, 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 Hayek identified this in Road to Serfdom, a book we should all revisit. It sits on our shelves and we don't read it nearly enough. Yeah, I spoke at, I think the Tea Party evolved over time. In the beginning, I think the big issue was the bailouts. And it was, it was it Santella, the same guy on CNBC who said, we need a new Tea Party thing. And it was like in the fall of, what, 08, it was right after TARP passed. And that is what I think where the name got the cachet from. And so I was at one of the early things. It was me, it was Jason Rank. There were some other real hardcore libertarian people, but also the headliner was Jonah Goldberg. Right, and so it was. Yeah. It was really awkward because he and I had crossed swords when I was in grad school, and we were sitting at a table right next to each other. And I was like, "Does he remember who I am or not?" You know, and it was anyway. But it was fine. It was cordial. Uh, but and so it was appealing, and we were trying. So everybody there, what was unifying them is they were against the bailouts, and that's fine. I could work with that. So I was trying to do what I, you know, alluded to earlier was to just give them a broader framework to say what what principles are behind that. So you're against the bailouts, but let's expand that. Look at what they're doing. They're trying to take over energy. They're trying to do this. They're trying to do that. They're trying to take over health care and, and go along those routes. And I left them with the parting words of, you know, you guys are, are probably going to do very well in the 2010 elections. You're going to elect a lot of new Republicans who are going to make a promises about how they're going to do this. If they don't do that, you can't then keep supporting them. And everyone applauded. And so there, but I, you can see what, what success that had. So. Well, I think they did even worse than that because, you know, in 2009, they were fighting against the bailouts and they, they, made, an, they made an Obama thing somehow. It was a George Bush thing. Um, and then it continued, of course, with the stimulus and so they were fighting against that. But, um, you know, John Boehner and Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney and Sarah Palin were all cheerleaders for the bailouts about how it would help mainstream America and everybody would suffer and Boehner's crying, and they, they all, they're cheerleaders for the, for the bailouts. And the very next year, these are the same people who are the headline speakers of Tea Party things. It, it didn't make any sense. And then, and then I saw them all do, well, we have to vote for Mitt Romney or Barack Obama will win. And, and then it's, it was just over by then. Yeah, but it, turns out this was, it turns out this was Julie's idea to uh, <laughs> blame it all on Barack Obama so that all the conservatives would be back on board. Julie. <laughs> Okay, we've got, um, we've got a, an election coming up here, uh, and we all know the Libertarian Party was founded in, what, 71? And, uh, you, you know, we've all been activists in it, and it gets discouraging after a while, you know? Um, as I'm sure it was for the Jews when they wandered the desert for 40 years, but at some point, uh, they stumbled into the Promised Land. Um, is, this, is this the year? Uh, you know, what... what, what we do have a two-party system. They don't like us. We're, the whole thing is rigged for us to lose. And yet, the conditions do seem interesting in a way they haven't been in the past. So I wonder if each of you would comment about the prospects for the Libertarian Party at the national level. Don't BS us. Just say it like it is. Right now. <laughs> I'm counting on you. OK, yeah, I, I don't. I have not been following these things too closely. I, I personally think it's more important that you understand the ideas of liberty and, and focus on other long-term things that I, I mean, Europe has parliamentary systems and it's, it's not like because they don't have the two-party system, they have liberty over there. So I'm, I like you know, I, what people are doing and I certainly think that it's one avenue of uh, getting people excited and providing opportunities to talk about these things, but I'm pretty, pessimistic in the in the short term because I, I think there's going to be an economic crash at some point and that's not going to be good. People are going to rush and sit to the government and say, yeah, take away more liberty if you just promise to bail us out and, and, and make everything nice. So what's your source of hope? Julie Borowski videos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think we might crack 1% of the vote. <laughs> um, but there's, like you said, there's still a two party system. They kind of, it's rigged. They're against the libertarian third parties. But I also think people are really haven't, I guess, I hate this word, wake up sheeple, but they haven't really woken up. I've even seen it, people already telling me, you know, if you don't vote for Trump, you're voting for Hillary. And I'm sure on their side, they're saying. Really? 
Oh, yeah. maybe we're getting the scare tactics. Yeah, that, uh, and I'm sure on their side, if you don't Trump vote for Hillary, there, it's a vote for Trump. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's a wasted yeah. vote. And, you know, I heard that. I voted for Gary Johnson in 2012, and I heard that, you know, I, I voted for Obama, and I'm sure I'll get that again this year. Um, how do you break that? I don't know, because people are so conditioned to the two-party system. Julie, you know how it always happens, and you've been through enough elections now, one, uh, two, to know this, that right at the end of the campaign, right before people vote, vote there's all the scare tactics that usually involves the Supreme Court. You know, yeah, it's no, like as, as bad as the Republican is, and yes, he's horrible, and yes, we, we loathe him, uh, he's more likely to appoint a better justices to mm -hmm. the Supreme Court. And whatever, whatever else we know about Hillary Clinton, she's, she's going to appoint a bunch of communists. So, I mean, this seems to work, like every time. Yes, it does. Um, somebody approached me last week, and I spoke in Vermont, and said, you know, I don't like Trump, but I'm afraid of Hillary Clinton's Supreme Court nominations. Um, it's very hard. I, don't, I really don't know how to respond to that. She Would might you die, you know. She's her? like, she might die. What? I don't know. She's healthy. She <laughs> might die. That's your source of hope. Oscar Wilde had something to say like that. But, um, no, do you think this is a valid concern, or do you think it's pure propaganda? I don't know. I that's honestly is not on the top of my list. Supreme Court nominations, so I don't know. Yeah. Guys, mansplain. Go. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> you know, I think that one area where where Ron Paul and I love saying Ron Paul was right. Ron Paul is right. Damn it. But uh, one area where Ron Paul was just so right, and everybody would say, "How did you become such a celebrity, such a rock star among these kids?" And he said, "It's not me. It's the message." And he was so consistent and just constantly delivering this pure message of liberty and exactly how it gives us hope as a country, not just everything is going to crash and it's just all going to be hell and that's why you need me to save you from it. He would say exactly, you know, what kind of prosperity we'd have from this, you know, his message. And listen, and it's too late. But, uh, but, he, would, but he would have this message. And, and if the libertarian candidates don't provide a true libertarian message, then I don't care. And that's, that's unfortunate. I don't care to support them if they don't do that. And, and not when do you person. rally the base by, you don't just rally the base. I mean, Ron Paul rallied everybody in, you know, all the college kids. Yeah. And they were just, this is, this is perfect. This is a message we've been waiting for. And now you're, now you're just going to waste that and just it's, try to get kind of co-opt back into the establishment. It's no good. You know, Ron, I worked for Ron uh, very early in my career, and I consider him a good friend. And you know he's the last person who ever wanted to rule anyone or anything. For him, it was he was like a, he's a he's like a saint. You know, I mean, it, for him, it really was about the ideas. And so often during that campaign, especially in 2012, um, I always had the sense, you know, like that scene from the, the movie Life of Brian, you know, where Ron was always telling people, "I'm not the Messiah," you know, and and yet I'm, sometimes it was never clear to me if the movement was as advanced as he was in this regard. You know, that the people really did think that he was the, that he, the issue was Ron and not his ideas. Yeah, so, um, I mean, people are still geared towards having a leader and, you know, obviously having a president and everything. So, <laughs> my, my example for how badly these things can turn out is uh, Ronald Reagan. To me, Ronald Reagan, looks like a libertarian on paper, and he has a lot of great quotes. He became president, he was not remotely libertarian as president. I mean, he vastly expanded the size of government. So, of course, I vote for the candidate that I believe in, which is nobody. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that if your goal is to win an election, that is kind of the difference between a Ron Paul campaign and a Rand Paul campaign. Ron Paul had a successful campaign because he was not trying to become president of the United States so much as to get the message out. And I think that's, that is an important goal to have. I mean, we have you know, a variety of goals. I don't think that we have to be you know, only zeroing in on one goal, but Ron Paul had a successful campaign even though he didn't become president. I don't know if I can say the same thing about Rand. Uh, so let's circle back to where we began on this whole thing before we open it up. 
And I think I would like to say something about that comment in particular. You said Ron, Ron's goal was just to spread liberty, and he only inadvertently became you know, a personal celebrity. Um, I mean, I make it a principle in my own work to just, to just work hard and say what's true, uh, and to not try to curry favor or pander to any particular group. Um, I tried my best to call things the way they are and, what, and whatever the fallout may be. And I think th the result has been probably personally good for me. Um, and I'd like to think it's done some good for the ideas of liberty. So I never set out, set out with an intention. You know, there's a difference, right, between just doing good work and setting out with an atten intention to get attention for yourself and become famous. I, I've never been good at that. I wonder if each of you could comment about like what drives you in your work uh, and how your personal fame may or may not figure into that. Okay, yeah, I, I try to not even think about that. I mean, to me, that, that's goofy. Just, you know, when you see people, I was like, whoa, I don't ever want to turn to that guy. Oh, my gosh. I, I wasn't pointing at you. I was just a generic, <laughs> but take that as you will. Um, and, and so, yeah, all I, what I try to do is my, as I try to remember what, what pushed me to get to where I was, and it was just gradually saying the, the scope of government, what does it need to do, and it just kept shrinking over time. Like, oh, yeah, you don't need minimum wage laws. And then, oh yeah, you don't need that post office to have a monopoly. That's crazy. And then just over time, you know, shrinking things. So that's what I try to do in my work. It's on like specific issues to explain the economics behind that. And just so yeah, it's now that I'm getting older, it it is gratifying. I don't set out to be famous or anything, but it it is nice if somebody. The best thing for me is when like a, a younger person comes up and says, "Oh, it was like your book, whatever, such and such that." brought me into these ideas or whatever, something like that. So, you know, I'm not going to lie that that makes me, you know, feel good. okay that it kind of gives you a boost to keep on writing you and stuff. You probably had this experience too, like I'll get a note that says, I loved your article. I'm like, what are you talking about, you know? I mean, I write an article every day. Probably one in six of my articles actually has a broad circulation. Why that one, I yeah. don't know. I never know. And, and people will write me and say, oh, you just wrote that so it would go viral. It's like, if I knew how to do that, I would do that with every one of my articles. You know? But I never have the slightest clue what people are going to care about. I, I really don't. I never have any idea. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a fine line. I'm also not good at marketing, and I, I intentionally try not to because I don't want to you know, be a, oh, what, what's, what's hot right now? Let me write on that. But there is a way, like, you follow the convert. I mean, I have... I'm on a podcast, as some of you know, that is devoted to making fun of Paul Krugman and criticizing him, right? So I can't say we don't just go what we know is going to be kind of popular and be red meat for the masses. That's, you know, they're not getting Austrian capital theory every week on that show. So, I mean, there is, there is that element, too, where you got to say what, what are people care. So I've been writing a lot on international trade lately. That's not because I threw a dart at a board. It's because everyone's talking about that I now. See. But the point is I'm going to say, well, what can I say that other people haven't yeah, said? Yeah. Let me try to teach it. It's not... What do I do There's so I get, you know, what, what do I do to maximize the number of shares on this? That's not how I'm thinking. Well, now, Julia, why don't you address this? And you, you are, I think of everybody here has really uh, you know, admitted that you really do make some videos targeted to particular audiences as, as like little honeypots for them, right? Is that the right word? Yeah. Is that the right word? Yeah. I mean, just, just try, you know, so you, you set out with a certain intention. But do you, when you go into this, when you, when you press submit, do you have a good instinct for what's going to rock it and, and what's, gonna, what's not? Um, sometimes and sometimes not. Sometimes I think a video is going to do really well and it doesn't, and that's really disappointing. But um, I do oftentimes make videos based on what's popular because I think there's going to be a lot of YouTube videos from liberal YouTubers talking about this issue. If I can talk about that issue and put a libertarian spin and get more viewers, I think that's a good thing. I don't think you should sacrifice substance. Um, a lot of my videos has a lot of goofy, silly faces and costumes, but I want there to also be the substance there too. There is some there. Um, gosh, and what keeps me doing what I do um, I, I just believe in what I do. I believe in what I say. I think I was raised in a household that really taught me to speak up um, in my views, right or wrong. 
And it is nice to, when people say, um, I like your video, it made me laugh. I think that's really cool that I could have a positive effect in somebody's life and I could make their day better, especially um, young kids who write me and their parents and say, you know, my kids love your videos. They're, you know, six and nine years old and they're really interested in politics because of you. I mean, that, that does wow. make me feel good. I think one of the things that motivates me is actually because we we try really hard to really influence it, politics in this country with, with our stupid memes, but we really try hard to 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 get that stuff out there. And if we make shareable content and it gets shared, we're we're so thrilled because it doesn't just get around. Sometimes when it gets around, it has this effect around the whole country where people just start to question the validity of whatever thing they believe in. And so, for example, as soon as I found out Bernie Sanders was running for president, as soon as I found out, I just started just ha using his hashtag, feel the burn, on everything I posted that would be against communism, against socialism, against Bernie Sanders, or even like just anti-Bernie Sanders memes. And they went around and around and around and around until, you know, people started to say, we really got to stop Bernie Sanders, and he lost a lot of primaries. So I'm proud of that. I, I love the fact that he lost. And, and yeah, like you see he lost to Hillary, but she won't live that long. So <laughs> I'm worried about that. But uh, using, you know, using hashtags, it actually does work for older people who are like, yeah, well, hashtags don't work on Facebook. Yeah, they, you, they work now. Um, and it does help things to trend. It helps things to get into people's news feeds, where if you write something, that it would be for our echo chamber. You know, that's anti Bernie Sanders stuff, but if I use his hashtag, that's all going to get into the news feeds of all the people who like him. And they're all going to have to just wade through it. And, and it's, it's great because it just kind of, it kind of makes them despair that people don't like their candidate. And I like when they despair because then, then hopefully they give up on, on, their, on their commie ridiculousness. He's more the publicist uh, in terms of Liberty memes. He's the one who cares how many people like the page. He's like waking up in the middle of the night and checking the analytics. He is. He's the, if you ever see Liberty Meme say, Facebook is blocking our posts, that's him. I don't care. <laughs> but to me, I, I have an artistic personality, and it's an artistic outlet for me in some ways. And, and I have a, a mind for like analyzing things down to the, the bare essential of it, which you know sort of makes for observations that people may miss. To me, the point of my page is to have a voice. People say that you vote to make your voice heard, but you're voting to make your candidate's voice heard, not yours. And to me, my memes have made my voice heard a whole lot more than any vote that I ever cast. Yeah. Okay, let's open it up. Uh, who has a question, a comment? Come on. So yeah, I don't know if everybody heard the question is that he, yeah, he's noticed that there's a, 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 a growing um, separation between uh, cap L libertarians and sort of right wing libertarians who are, who are drawn towards Trump. And the question is, what ways can, what, what can we do to, to bring these two sides together, I think is your, is your issue, which I mean, really raise the question, you know, should we? You know, I, I, had, a, I had a funny thing uh, happen to me recently where some, a person came to me, because I've written, I mean, I wrote, I wrote an article in June of 2015 that appeared in Newsweek magazine called Donald Trump is a Fascist. Okay, so I've been kind of out front, you know, on this issue. And I had a guy come to me and say, you know, you really shouldn't otherize these people, which is a, a funny phrase to use in this context. But um, I thought about it later, and I thought, no, probably I should, actually. <laughs> so, because um, I have an allergy to brown shirts, basically. And I, and, and, uh, and I think libertarians are too unwilling to recognize the threats 
that come in the form of anybody claiming to be anti-PC or anti, anti, anti left wing. You know, we're, we're like, oh, go, you know, we love you. But actually, it's a different form of threat. And I have to admit that in my, in my case, I'm very much influenced by the life and work of Ludwig Mises, who I hope to talk about l later tonight. So anyway, uh, if anybody wants to address that question, go ahead. Well, I, I took a slightly different, I thought you were more asking, like, what if there's libertarians who are actually more favorable to the Republican Party versus, like, the more hard, hardcore theory people? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so with, with me, I'll, I'll just be really quick. I know we're running a long time. I just try, again, try to make sure, like, if, if I find something, like, everybody's for lower marginal tax rates. Like, let's lower the capital gains tax or whatever, you know. But instead of just focusing on some study that shows, oh, actually, economic growth is higher, like, to, you know, bring in moral elements, like, you know, that's, that, that's why does the government have a right to that money or so You know what I mean? To try to bring in more principles to then, if they get that, then it might be, okay, so if the government can't take your money, then why can they, you know, tell you what plant you can smoke? You know, that kind of stuff to try to ground, their, with the stuff where we agree, ground it on an issue, a, a broader principle that then would spill over elsewhere. And so they might say, yeah, why do I trust? Or you don't trust these people to revitalize the inner city in Detroit, right? No, of course not. But how come then they can remake the Middle East? That doesn't make any sense. It's the same people, you know, stuff like that. Any other uh, comments along those lines? Well, I was just holding the microphone. I wasn't really going to say anything. <laughs> But um, I'll, I'll answer him anyway. Um, I just, uh, for us, where we just put out the content that we believe in and just keep it going, we're, you know, admitted in this room, but we're, we're small L libertarians. We're libertarians. I think it's the big L because it's the philosophy, and I live the philosophy, uh, the non aggression principle, which is of the utmost importance to libertarianism. And, uh, so we, you know, we live the philosophy and, and keep promoting it, and we can't, I, it's not my job to tell you what to do, and so people come to their own conclusions and end up in whatever coalitions they end up in, and that's, that's on them. If they follow the philosophy, you know, they'll, people usually will do some research and find their way to wherever they end up. I, I question whether or not people will do some research. I, I began to wonder that, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, anybody, any other questions? I mean, this is a rare opportunity here. Go ahead. Bob, why don't you just answer this? The question concerns reciprocal trade agreements and whether or not we should, we should have unilateral free trade. Yeah, so n number one, I have been surprised by how openly people are em embracing protectionism, and it makes me just think free market economists have done a terrible job. And I, I mean, I'm not being facetious. I'm re I really am like, wow, we, we've lost the minimum wage, and now we're losing free trade. I mean, that, that you, seriously, when I was growing up, that was the two areas where they would say, now economists broadly left and right agree that minimum wage you know, reduces teen employment and free trade is good. And now those have both gone out the window and you know, Kruven makes fun of people who might believe that. So to answer the, the specific question though, the standard case for free trade is a unilateral one. That yes, it would be even better if, the, if we lowered our tariff barriers and then other th places lowered theirs. But I mean, tariffs are taxes. You know, it makes it more expensive for US people to buy stuff. So if they want to tax their people, we don't say, oh, I'm going to show you. We're going to tax our people, too. Ha, ha. That doesn't make us better off. What do you think about Trump's idea of stealing uh, money from, uh, from uh, Mexican workers so they can't send it home to the families in Mexico? I'm not in favor of that. OK. Uh, yeah, in the back.
That's awesome. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's nice. Just, just to just to clarify, though, I only I don't work Sundays, so just to clarify. So it's now we're out of, now out of time. So um, does anybody know what time dinner begins? Uh, Seven o'clock. So we've got a little time before then, right? I don't. I think. Do, do we count as VIPs? Is, everybody's a VIP. Don't we believe in universal rights? No. Okay, we don't. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Please do. Thank you all so much for coming. I'll see you shortly. All right. That hour.